but like you've got to be passionate about something. And guess what, folks? You are all passionate about first. And you were all passionate. You were in this room for a reason, unless your mentor forced you to come or something like that. But you were here. I'm not going to ask. I was going to say, put your hand up if your mentor forced you to be here. I don't want to hear that. It's going to be depressing for me or something like that. All of 1923 puts their hand up over there. Yeah, yeah all right. Team Thumbie over there. Okay. It's, it's, you know, so you have this passion. So take it somewhere. Find the things that you love about first because there's so many different things about this program and see what other jobs there are in that area, what fields of study there are. If you are really into the scouting, who here is here for the scouting content? If you were really into that data analysis, so like when I was in school, there was no such thing as a job as a data analyst or an analytics guru. Now that's what all the world needs. Man, if I could redo school right now, I would go so hardcore into stats and like try and get my way onto an NFL team as their analytics person. That opportunity exists for all of you. I am expecting that 10 years from now, one of the people in this room is going to be an analytics staffer for one of the big four sports teams. Or you're going to pioneer in another area. The Canadian National Swim Team is a team I like to talk about because they just come on the scene the last few years. How many of you are familiar with the name Michael Phelps? Greatest swimmer of all time. Greatest swimmer of all time. Are you, how many of you are familiar with the name Summer McIntosh? Summer McIntosh is the next big thing. She's a Canadian swimmer, age 16, set a world record a couple weeks ago in the pool right beside my house. Um, how has Canada Swimming suddenly identified people like Summer McIntosh, Penny Alexiak, all these stars? They have a high-performance analytics team that looks at the swim times of 10-year-olds, I'm not kidding, to identify who the high-potential athletes are and say, wait a second, we got a gem right here, let's get them into the best training facilities and stuff. But they have secret analytic models on what they're looking at, whether it be stroke rate, stroke composition, and it's not necessarily they're looking for the fastest 10-year-old swimmer. They're looking for the one with the most potential. Does that sound familiar to what anyone's doing this weekend? You're not necessarily looking for the robot that's performing the best out there. You might be looking for the one with the most potential, saying, hey, we're going to be like the number seven alliance. We know we're going to have to play 254 in 2056. By the way, the elephant in the room, that, that alliance is going to happen. Um, <laughs> I, we can talk about this or not, but I mean, these, maybe it won't happen. Maybe it won't, but... Either way, if your alliance was seven or eight, you want to pick someone on a little bit of potential who says, hey, they have the ingredients to pull off an upset. And let me tell you, in this game, no matter how good an alliance is, anyone can be beat. Uh, my friend over here is representing Team 9098. Anyone familiar with Team 9098 from Ontario this year? Rookie team. You're going to hear a lot about them in this presentation. So they pulled off one of the upsets of the century last year, the, last week at the Ontario Provincial Championship, as the number seven alliance captain. And... They knocked off 2056, sent them to the lower bracket. Totally changed the style of that event. I'll talk specifically about that robot in a little bit because that's the robot that 85% of you probably should have built. I'm serious. It's a little tank drive robot that only scores in the low goal, but is arguably like one of the top six robots in the province of Ontario and unfortunately couldn't be here this weekend, but I'll nail the simplicity principles. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. We are going to relentlessly chase perfection, knowing we full well we will not catch it because nothing is perfect. But we are going to relentlessly chase it because in the process, we will catch excellence. I am not remotely interested in being just good. You can come to this event with a lot of different goals, and it is totally okay whatever your goals are. But it's very important to understand that, okay, perfectionism. It can be a problem. Nothing in this world is perfect. However, there is something to be said about striving for perfection. Because when you strive for perfection, you will never reach perfection, and that's okay. But you will catch excellence along the way. And that's what the best FRC teams do. They are always constantly trying to get better. I just talked about 254 and 2056. What do you think they're doing right now? They are trying to find ways to get better even at this event. 2056 averaging 15 cycles a match or something ridiculous like that, like when you include their auto, they want to do more at this event. They're not just going to be like, hey, we're content with this level. 
And that is one of the biggest characteristics of the best FRC teams. The robot is never done. They're always looking for ways to improve, looking for ways to iterate. If you pick up that skill from first and take that into your life, you are going to be so, so awesome. But it comes with an important caveat. You must remember that perfection doesn't exist, and you cannot beat yourself up for not being perfect. No one is perfect. No, there's all these aspirational goals of what you're trying to be. At the end of the day, all you can be is the best version of yourself. And that's kind of important for this next comment. And this quote is not Ralph Waldo Emerson. I made these slides super sloppy. This is John Abley, the former chair of uh, FIRST. There are two ways to compete in this world. You can drag your opponent down or you can rise above them. Which is better for our society in the long run? But John Abley gave this quote, I remember it totally changed my perception on everything. There's two ways to compete. Competition can be, hey, I win, you lose. Or it can be like, oh, they're ahead of me, I'm gonna drag them down. Or it's like, I'm gonna find a way to rise above. The characteristics of the best teams at FRC, they are the teams that are not looking at someone and being like, oh, that, like, say, hey, that robot's so amazing. Oh, whatever. It's all built by mentors. The best teams don't say that. They say, wow, that robot is so good. How can we be like that? Wait, I know how. Let me go talk to them. To be successful in this program, you have to be constantly trying to learn. This happens outside of FIRST all the time. Think about you know, that girl in school you know, who has the highest grades, just kicking butt. 99% and everything. I know you Americans use this grade point scale. I don't understand how that works. I, it's a 99%. I know what that means. It's a stat with context. You know, what do people say about her, though? Ah, she probably studies all the time. She doesn't have any friends. Why would you say that? What do you know? You know, or like, what about like, it's like, oh, like, look at Mr. Popular over here. You know, he's like on the captain of the football team. It's like, yeah, he's probably a jerk. Do you actually know that? Why are we constantly looking for reasons to to demean other people's success. It doesn't benefit you. Even if you're right, it doesn't benefit you. What benefits you is looking at what's successful. How can I be like that? Or how can I be better than that? It's about trying to rise above. If we can get this philosophical belief through the culture change that FIRST achieves, we can make this world a better place. But let me say, folks, this is something that FIRSTers struggle with because there is just this tendency to knock the top teams and just be like, oh, yeah, they're cheating, for sure, for sure. Mentor built robot, you know, or like, oh, like, we can be better than that, folks. We can be better than that. Limits, like fears, are often just an illusion. Uh, Michael Jordan said that in his Hall of Fame speech when uh, he got inducted back in 2000 and something. I'm gonna talk a lot about limits in this presentation because I'm gonna talk a lot about understanding your resource level and staying within your resource level to best build the best possible robot. However, it is important to understand that sometimes the limits that you perceive for yourself aren't actually real, they're propagated by others. There is a tendency among society to try and put people in boxes. And it happens, especially for people who go to school with the same people from grade one through grade 12. You, are put into a role. You were suddenly typecast from being a kid. I, I am a jock, I am a nerd, I am a popular or whatever. And you live within those limits of, oh, this is all I could possibly do. But guess what, folks? Chances are those limits aren't real. And it's important to recognize where the limits aren't real and where they are to make sure that you can achieve to be the best of who you are. Okay, folks, that's the, uh, that's the soft stuff. Let's go into strategic design. Anyone familiar with the term strategic design? Throw up your hand. Okay, okay, good. For those of you who aren't familiar, strategic design is the process of deciding what your design is going to be. We're not talking about, hey, what is the robot going to look like? It is what is the characteristics of the robot? Designing and building a cool robot is fun. I think that designing and building a cool robot that does well in competition is even more fun. So you need to have a concrete aim when you start. I think the clear choice is that your aim should be, we want a ro the best possible robot. But you have to set 
your goals. Some teams will have other objectives. They, we want the nicest looking robot. We want a very elegant robot. We want to do something cool. These are all valid things here, but hey, be careful with the cool factor. If you're like always like, oh, we want our team to just do the weirdest and wackiest things, that is your choice. But in the first robotics competition, you always have two alliance partners that you're playing with, and you may be unintentionally letting them down, and maybe that's something you're okay with. But through all of this, I just want to see what's on the next slide. Yeah, I'm going to stay back here. You need to have your goals, and goals for your team, because it's not as simple as saying, oh, our goal is to win. Win how? There's different ways to win in first. It's on the field. A reasonable goal is to say, at the beginning of the season, we want to be an alliance captain at the championship. A similar goal could be, we want to be a second pick at the championship. Those two goals will have very different strategic designs. And so you need to kind of figure out where your goals want to be. How are you going to figure that out? We're going to talk a little bit about this in a couple slides. I do want to recommend that there is a great presentation on goal setting by Mike Corsetto of the Citrus Circuits. I want all of you after this to go check that presentation out. It is really, really good. It dives deeper into this topic than I could. Uh, the Citrus Circuits, Team 1678, the presentation is by Mike Corsetto, and it's called Goal Setting. And uh, Mike Corsetto's resume has been on Einstein every single year since 2013. Their team has not lost an event since 2014. I'm serious. That, it, it's, it's wild what they've done. 2056 had a streak up in Ontario where they won 23 straight events from their first ever event, like as a rookie, and it just continued. The Citrus Circuits could break that streak. And I thought that was a record that would never be broken. They could break that next year. And it is uh, wild to think about. There are some awesome teams in this program. Another thing I want to mention here is don't try and benchmark yourself against the top teams. In first, we are all playing at different levels. And obviously, you want to try and get to certain levels. But like, if you were a high school gymnast, you would not be benchmarking yourself against Simone Biles. It just wouldn't make sense because you have to work within your resource level where you are, you know? And so there's a tendency of teams to start trying to be like, this is what we have to do to be 254. This is what we have to do to be 2056. And maybe you can be that team. But you have to know where your reasonable limits are. You don't want to set yourself up for disappointment in that way. So it's about being reasonable in these sort of aspects. At the same time, you're never going to get to a goal until, unless you strive beyond it. It's like the whole marathon thing. If you just set out to run a marathon, it's going to be hard. But if you set out to run a little bit further, you'll probably get there. I have not gotten there yet. So you get the game. The first thing you have to do, this, how does strategic design work? It's like you have to figure out what you want your robot to do. And if you said, oh, well, we want to win, we want to score more points than our opponents or whatever, you have to actually figure out how those things happen. So the first thing you should do when you get the game is, well, actually, I want to say this is the first thing you should do, is understand the ranking system. Because if your goal is to win matches and to be an alliance captain of the championship, you have to understand how the ranking system works. The ranking system in first has changed many times over. Uh, when I first started doing it, it wasn't actually about winning matches. You got points based on how many points your opponents scored in matches. Win-loss was not the first sort. If I, you know, if I won a match 100 to nothing, and then my friend Billy over here won a match 30 to 20, Billy would have been ahead of me in the standings because his opponent scored 20 points, and that's what the ranking system was based on. You're probably like, what? That doesn't make sense. Yeah, it sort of didn't make sense, but that's what it was. And you, lots of teams didn't understand it. Then there was what I would consider the golden era from, I took the dates out there, but like 2004 to whatever. It was win-loss. Win more matches, it was very easy. Win matches, that's good. Then uh, there was 2015 where... There was no wins and losses. Teams just, you had to score as many points as possible in a three on O match. You had to understand that. Now we're at a point, the paradigm shift, which happened after 25, 50, 2015. Now there's ranking points. And lots of teams don't design for ranking points. And you need to design around ranking points, especially if your goal is to be an alliance captain. This year, one of the ranking points was getting five links. It didn't matter if you put your, if the links were on the high row, the middle row, or the low row. 
Where is it easiest to score? So the easiest way to get links is the low row, right? So many teams were just like, oh yeah, we can just drop pieces in the low. Teams who optimized around the low goal disproportionately, out, they disproportionately outperformed their ability. And that was wild to see. And so many teams missed this. Some teams stumbled upon it by accident when their arm fell off. 1923, the best low goal robot in the world, started off as a high goal robot. And then this unfortunate accident happened, and they suddenly shifted the game or whatever, won two events and then finalists at the district championship. And the team that everyone wants on their alliance here at the championship this week, um, especially with the rule change, which we will talk about at some point. So understand all the ways to score points. Um, also, like, think of things... If you stick to conventional paradigms, you will miss things. Did everyone see the jumping robot last year? The coolest thing ever, Team 4907, just jumping up in the air. How many of you actually considered a jumping robot last year? Okay, someone, someone did. Yeah, you dismissed it. I did too, bruh. It's all good. You know, so you need to think about these things because you could miss something really big. Now, the jumping thing, that was really, really hard. I don't know if others could have pulled it off or whatever. I feel like the next time there's a hanging game in first, we're going to have like 30 jumping robots. It's going to be wild because everyone's going to like, oh, yeah, we know how to, that's done. You have to look at all these things. You should also consider every possible way of denying your opponent's points because if wins and losses is still a criteria, denying your opponents can be in a very effective strategy, except in this year's game where defense is kind of like not a thing. But I, I mean, like, it's interesting because normally I come at the championship, I tell everyone it's going to be two, two offense, one defense, two offense, one defense. Does anyone think that's going to be a thing this weekend? I, I don't, I don't see it. I just don't see it because of the way the game is. But how do you, how do you discover these things? It's, the best teams don't discover it during week one of competition season. The best teams figure this out in advance because they've analyzed the game. They've looked at the paths where robots could travel. So this is all part of the strategic design process. I want to talk a little bit about chokehold strategies because they're really cool. Anyone know what a chokehold strategy is? Anyone familiar with this term? Okay, good. There's some of you who do know this. It is a strategy which, when executed, guarantees victory independent of any action by your opponents. This has actually happened in first games before. It probably will never happen again because the first game design committee has gotten so good over the years. The first thing they do when they develop a game, hey, is there a chokehold strategy? Because it's not actually fun when one robot can guarantee victory in every match. And you might be like, how did this happen? Like, so it did in 2002. How many of you were alive in 2002? Yeah, okay, the mentors. All right, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have our constellation group and we'll check our rusty necks and everything like that. In that game, there were three goals on the field. They were 180 pounds each. They were on wheels. If you got a goal into a certain zone, you got 10 points for it. There's only three of them. So that's 30 points right there. You could score balls in the goals but the balls in the goals only counted if they were in the goal zone. So meaning, if, if I, there's only three goals. If I get three goals into my goal zone, I've got 30 points, and my opponents can't get any ball points. How else could you score points in that game? You got points for getting robots back to your end zone at the end of the match. But there's only two robots on my alliance, and that's only 20 points. Oh, I'll kidnap one of my partner's robots, which was a thing you could do back in 2002. You were allowed to grab robots and take them with you. <laughs> First was a weird world. You wonder why so many of your mentors are so strange? It's because we were, went through this system. It, is like, it was like bizarre, the stuff that we lived through. So it's like, okay, I'm going to take my robot. I'm going to grab three goals. And then I'm going to find a way. It's like the most you could get was a 30-30 tie. What was the tiebreaker that year? The amount of goals. So if you could get all three goals into the zone, you'd win every match. The catch was the goals were 180 pounds each. And the ro they started, one started about here, one started about where the podium is, one started about here. So you're like, how could one robot get all three goals? 
And people like the jumping robot dismiss this. They're just like, yeah, it's never going to happen. Like, sure, you could do Like, lots of people thought of the strategy. So this is going to hurt me, but how many of you are familiar with Team 71, the Beatty Beast? Okay, some people are. Some people are. They won four world championships in the span of, like, six years or something. It just They were the cheesy poofs before the cheesy poofs were the cheesy poofs. Best team ever. Back then... Um, the people, a lot of teams didn't share a lot of details about their robots, and so no one would know what 71's robot would look like until you got to a competition, they opened their crate. There would be a lineup of like 100 people waiting for them to open their crate to see what they had in there. So that year they had a robot that stood up, it was like five feet tall, and then it would fall over to start the match, and then expand these massive arms, and it would grab all three goals, except it would blaze out to get to the goals so, so, so fast. These giant arms, which would grab the goal and had the, could not let go. They physically couldn't let go. And then they'd freaking hulk it, the goals go, and bring them all in. So now they got these 380 pound goals, but then they shifted into a super, super low gear, moving at about a one inch per second, and just crawled to the spot. But because they had a 380 pound goals, they, they would lift them a little bit. So they transferred that weight onto their robot. And they didn't drive on wheels. They walked on file cards, which were the things you use to clean a file. They used that metal to dig into the carpet. You know the rule that says you can't have metal talking to the carpet? It's because of that. <laughs> so they would grab these three, and they would inch ever so slowly into the zone. It was the wildest thing. And as soon as they grabbed the goals, the match was over. If they got the three, the match was over. And first game announcers, we're trained. We're very much trained to like never make the match seem like it's over. Everyone has a chance. Everyone has a chance to win. And there was this announcer from New England, and he had like this thick Boston accent. And so one time, this is the playoffs, it's the semis. Beatty grabs all three goals, and he's like, he doesn't know what to say. He's like, well, it ain't over till it's over, but there's not much hope. <laughs> and it was the thing. There was one time where Beatty tried to grab all three goals, but they missed one of the goals, and they accidentally grabbed onto Team 67, the hot team, who was like back then, and still now, one of the best teams in the world. Well, they can't let go. So they're like, oh, I guess we'll just grab our arm. Woof! Just took a robot freaking flying. And so there was the, the goal that they missed, Team 68 grabbed it, and then 68 tried to grab one of the goals that uh, 71 already had. So now 68 is part of this mass. 71 pulled 540 pounds of goals and 240 pounds of robots, inch by inch, man. <laughs> I honestly only tell this story because it's funny. Uh, there will probably not be a chokehold. But what did I say earlier about Striving for perfection, you'll catch excellence along the way. When you break down a game, if you look for a chokehold, you will identify optimal strategies. You will probably not find a chokehold, but you will find optimal strategies. The way you do this is algebra, folks. You lay out all the possible ways to score points. You pick a subset of them. Say, if we do all this, is there a way for our opponents to surpass it? Um, it is highly unlikely in any game where they're recycling game pieces, like in traditional games. In a game like this, it may have been possible, but you can't play defense, so, you know. I mean, you can, just no one has seen the way to be good at it. I would love to see someone be good at defense this championship, because it might make it more exciting, but I don't know. We'll see. All right, cost-benefit analysis. This is where it comes in. How do you decide on your strategic priorities? Well, you need to p value the priorities that are high reward, low effort. You always want to maximize that reward to effort ratio. So I want to talk about this. High grid, well, let's not talk about this year yet. Let's talk about 2019. Scoring high on the rocket. How many of you were around for 2019? Okay, thank you. There's, some of you were. There were three levels on the rocket, and you, there was like 12 scoring spots on each rocket, plus a cargo ship which had 16 scoring spots sounds about right. 
most of those scoring spots were down low, except they were all worth the same amount of points. So many teams still said, we got to score high. We got to score high. And at high levels, you probably did need to score high. Uh, team 973 did, chose not to score high that year, and they won the world championship. You do not have to do the hardest task. They decided to be really, really good at the lower task. It can be done. This year's game, we come back to it. High grid versus low grid. Yes, high grid, five points to that top row. However, links are the key to ranking well in this game. So yes, the low grid isn't worth as many points. However, those links get you the five bonus points and can help you get the RP. And the low goal was totally undervalued. And this is what I was telling you about Team 9098 from Ontario. They were a low goal specialist. Cubes only. I guess they could sort of pick up cones, sort of kind of a thing. Yeah, it was like sometimes they would end up in your gripper, you know. Tank drive, kit bot, small kit bot, would fly over the charge station just back and forth. And before you knew it, the entire low goal was filled. And then eventually they figured out how to like pop the cubes up a little bit and get them mid and high. And it's like that robot was so simple. I, I don't want to trivialize it. Like it's hard to design. It's still a challenging build. But trust me, it is way simpler than all these three degree of freedom arms I've seen out there or four or five or six. A simple robot gets you to places you want to go. We'll talk about this more. I'm going to come back to this robot. I'm going to keep coming back to 9098. So when you're making your priority list, we talked about how to figure out what your priorities are. Now it's time to make the list. You want two different lists. You need to think about qualities first. So speed, power, agility, center of gravity. One of the first decisions that anyone should be making is like how fast should I be able to go in this game? Or do I need to have more acceleration? Do I need to have more pushing power? You determine these things by your strategic design, by evaluating the game tasks. Then you can start looking at robot functionality. So like your priority list may be start off with, we want a fast robot. That is a good way to start. But then you might want to get to, oh, we want a fast robot that traverses the field and any bumps without opposition. You need to think your way through these things. Once you have these two lists, you can merge them together, and then you start on a drive system. Swerve, should you do it? This is wild to me, because Swerve used to be like this almost godlike thing in FRC when I first started, where there was only like three teams who could actually do a Swerve drive. Um, I remember Big reason why I'm here today is the first time I saw a robot go sideways in 1998, Chief Delphi. They were the first team that ever did Swerve, and it changed my life. I was like, I want to do this somehow or whatever. But Swerve for the longest time was reserved for only teams with the most advanced manufacturing capabilities. Then enters the content ring, SDS, West Coast Products. Suddenly, you can just buy Swerve off the shelf. And it used to be, oh, well, sure, you can build a Swerve, but it's so hard to program, except like there's libraries all over the place. If you want like Caleb Dodd's Swerve code, it's like online, you know? It's... So when we talk about high reward, low effort, is Swerve low effort yet? No. Is it high reward? Yes. So this is something teams need to think about. 74% of the robots here at the championship have a Swerve drive. That's a little scary. Um, I don't know what it's going to mean for the long-term health of this program because uh, the one thing I didn't talk about, Swerve, is it's expensive. I would hate to think that we're getting into a pay-to-play situation here in first. I'm waiting for someone to be like, Karthik, it's been a pay-to-play for the last 20 years. But I, okay, you can make the joke. You can make the jokes, folks. I'm serious. You can, like, make the jokes. Um, we'll talk more about this in a bit. Okay. So now your priority list. We're talking about robot functionality priority list. This never changes. What should be the number one priority list in a game? Drive. This is super, super important because people missed it this year. So many people missed it. Because when we say drive, it's not just that the robot should move. It should move effectively 
across all obstacles on the field. And what does that necessitate in this year's game? Someone say it out for me. So I'm here at Cable Charge Station, Cable Bump, but what would make you better at crossing the charge station? What would make you better at crossing the bump? Low center of gravity. And if your number one priority is your drivetrain, you should not be trading off your center of gravity in a game with obstacles. Did you see a lot of teams who traded off center of gravity this year? They were always tipped over, folks. It was like, and it's so painful because teams traded off center of gravity so they could score high. Except if you did your strategic analysis, you realized, wait a second, I'd be better off building a robot with a low center of gravity that doesn't score high like 9098 did. And that is so important. That's why these priority lists matter. Most seasons, if your team has a bad season on the field, 90% chance it is because of poor strategic design. If your robot has a great season, 90% chance it is because of smart strategic design. If you are a team who is like, it is so hard to compete with the teams with so many resources, I feel for you. It is hard to compete. But the key to unlock is that strategic design can outweigh a big budget. It can outweigh mentor resources. It can outweigh experience. It can outweigh machining resources. Strategic design is the key. But you have to remember this. So if drivetrain is the number one priority, what should be the number two priority? Oh, Ian. I like you, Ian. You're my new friend here. OK, buddy? We both dismissed the jumping robot. We're both in the same club. So you're in the same club. Do you, you build a local tank robot? Everyone, be like Ian, OK? <laughs> be like Ian. Ian is considerate enough to Also, I want to say. Oh, geez, Ian. OK, all right. Well, it was going so well for you, dude. You know, sometimes it's OK to not keep talking, you know? <laughs> Ian, you're great, man. Hey, Ian, I also thank you for being very considerate of everyone and wearing a mask. I respect that. So priority number two should be intaking. It's always move is the number one priority, and you want to do that at a 10 out of 10. Then acquire and release game pieces. And then score, because you can never, well, I shouldn't say never. Depends on the game challenges. In most games, you cannot score unless you could acquire and release a game piece. And so this People miss this all the time. The game comes out, and people already say, oh, let me start designing the pink arm. Let me start designing like a three degree of freedom arm. You should work on moving first. And don't overlook it, because there are so many teams this year, some of the best teams in the world, who didn't prioritize movement, or they thought they did, but then they ended up top heavy. So these are the sorts of lessons. OK, folks, if you're going to walk away with this presentation with anything, if you're going to walk out of this presentation with anything, well, maybe the quotes at the beginning, also an appreciation for my great socks. Don't these look freaking fire? Thank you very much. Thank you. My mom got them for me for Christmas. She knows, she knows what's up. She knows what's up. These two golden rules. These two golden rules apply to robots, but they apply to life. Golden rule number one, always build within your team's limits. What does that mean? First, you have to define your limits. Limits are defined by people power, like the amount of people on your team, the experience of the people on the team. Are you a bunch of grade nines who've never done this before? Or are you grade 12s who were on Einstein the last two years? Mentor experience. This one really matters. Mentorship is the most, one of the most powerful drivers of success in FIRST. If you have a group of mentors who have been doing this for a while and understand how things work, you can do some more complicated things. If your mentors are brand new, maybe you have to go a little bit simpler. And of course, budget. We can't dance around it. You know, that's going to limit what you can do. You may want to do a swerve drive, but you can't afford. I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna go on a rant about the cost of motors. I'm not gonna go on the rant about the cost of motors, but I think it is ridiculous that we have a motor in this program that costs over two hundred dollars, though. That was $140 like two seasons ago. Doesn't anyone think that's weird? Yeah. I'm 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 just just saying this. I don't think it got, no, I'm stopping. I'm stopping. I'm stopping here, folks. I'm stopping. I'm stopping here, you know. No, 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 no. 
See, the thing is, people know that you can dare me, get me to say something I shouldn't if you just keep egging me on. So I'm, I'm stopping. I'm stopping, you know? It's all chill. It's all chill, right? Okay. So you have to stay within your limits. But limits, like fears, are often an illusion. You have to really understand where your limits come. Also, as you get more experience, you need to start cautiously pushing a few boundaries. If you always stay within the box, you may never grow as a team. But there's a trap. I want to talk to my friends on 9098 right now because there's a trap. You were so successful this year with your low goal, kit drive, crossing over the ramp robot. There might be a tendency to next year to be like, okay, we've mastered that. We've surpassed that. We should go with something much more complicated. But remember what got you your success. And remember that your limits, just because you had a successful season, doesn't mean your limits may have changed. And that is so important to remember. Golden rule number two. If a team has 10 units of robot and functions have a maximum of 10 units, sorry, if a team has 30 units of robot and functions have a maximum of 10 units, it is better to do three things at 10 out of 10 than five things at six out of 10. The jack of all trades in first is the master of none. It is okay to do a couple things really, really well. I'll talk about 9098 again. They were, their drivetrain was small, so it allowed lots of people on the charge station. Got, people got up there easy. It flew over the charge station, flew over the cable protector. They could use any lane, and it just did low goal. I think if the team had tried to do a high goal robot, the other things wouldn't have been as good, and they would not have been as successful. And if you're thinking, oh, it's like a cute little rookie robot, they sent 2056 to the loser's bracket at the Ontario Provincial Championship. They almost beat them in the loser's bracket. It was phenomenal with a robot that most teams could have built the same robot, if not a better version of it. A team who has more resources, a few more resources than a rookie team could have built a swerve drive version of that robot. Oh wait, that's what 1923 did. And that's the team that everyone wants on their alliance here at the championship. But they're only in one division that's presented by the CIA. I'm just saying the division name, folks. I don't know what everyone's laughing at. I'm just saying the division name. The snipers are going to get me. They're going to poison me or something. I'm a foreign national. Uh, Trade-offs, folks. So you can't do everything. We just decided that. We said, hey, jack of all trades, master's on. Actually, I'm going backwards for a second because I want to give some life advice. This applies in the real world, folks. First kids are like the most spectacular students you'll meet. But some kids want to do everything. They want to be the captain of the robotics team. They also want to be on the debate team. They want to play soccer and they want to run track. You cannot do everything. And if you try and do everything, you will inevitably fail. So you need to have limits. And in life, we have to have priority lists. So in my opinion, in, your, in all of our lives, our number one priority should be our health. I think our number two priority should be our family and loved ones. And number three priority, friends. Actually, sorry. Friends kind of fit into the loved ones. Then your grades. Then your extracurricular activities. And I know all of 1923 is like, oh boy, the uncle is talking right now. <laughs> but I'm serious, folks. If you are prioritizing first over your physical or mental health, that's dangerous. And I've seen first students go down this road at times because they just care so much. They love their team so much. They want to win. They want to be excellent. But your health matters. I have also seen first kids prioritize, especially college mentors, <sighs> college mentors, who put so much time into first they don't have that social life in college. And then 10 years later, they regret it. They're like, all their, they don't realize they don't actually have adult friends because they didn't meet people in college because they were spending all their time at a high school. Uh, hey, I mentored a team when I was in college too, folks. But it's important to have some breath there that you're focusing on your loved ones and your personal lives. And then your grades. I see this 
all the time. First students put so much time into first and it hurts their grades. And there's a little myth out there. It's propagated by, well, people. That um, you can have bad grades and your extracurriculars will outweigh them when you're applying to schools. Schools will even say that sometimes. Truth is, it's not the way it works. Your GPA is the driving factor, especially now in the US where they are not uh, requiring standardized tests as much. You don't have that get out of jail free card. Your grades are the thing that drives it. And so it's so important that you focus on your grades. Your first team, if, if your mentor's like, hey, no, you don't need to study for that test. We need you to stay, come in and program the robot tonight. That mentor is doing you a disservice. And to all the mentors in the room, when you have that impulse, back away from that impulse, folks. Back away from that impulse. You know, get more kids, like do something different. Students, you need to prioritize your grades. I, some of the, one of the best, some of the best engineers I know are in jobs right now where they're making one third of what they could be making because they ended up not getting into the school they wanted to and went to a lower school. And the, these sorts of things matter. There's some companies, I'm from Canada. Um, there are some companies that will only ha hire engineering graduates from the University of Waterloo, period. And there are money to be made. But you're, it's so weird and stupid that your high school grades are affecting your salary when you're 30. But it can actually happen. So keep your, keep your grades up and keep focused on these sorts of things. First will always be there and your mentors will always be able to tailor something that works for you. So this is really important. You cannot do it all, even if you want to. I'm sorry, that's kind of a downer. Let's talk about something fun. Let's talk about something fun. Um, I, I don't want to be a dad. Like, folks, you're all getting into college. Don't worry. I'm not saying that your lives are being ruined or anything like that, you know? Don't worry. You have social lives. You'll find a prom date. It's okay. Just, just don't ask them in public. That's weird. I'm not making bread and promises for anyone, actually, though. Hey. Okay. Um, trade-offs, trade-offs, trade-offs. How do you decide? How do you decide between two things? Like, Speed versus power, complexity versus durability, high COG with more scoring or low COG with less scoring. You make these choices based on your priority list. Can someone tell me what time it is? I feel like I've been talking for a while. Oh, oh, we got lots of time. We can talk about anything we want right now. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Anyone excited for the new Guardians movie? I am, I am so pumped, but let me be, be clear. I'm going to be a wreck if one of them dies. I, if, if Rocket goes, I am, I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna be a wreck. If any of you have been on MCU spoilers and know what's gonna happen, don't say it. No spoilers. Spoilers are the worst. Remember the golden rules, folks. Teams who try and do more than they're capable of tend to fail. There is no shame in building a simple robot. It's actually kind of cool when you win with a simpler robot. And it doesn't just have to be like talking about, you know, I've used the 9098 example. There are so many teams this year that built simple, simple angled elevator, angled elevator up with an everybody intake and just had a, pardon? Triangle, triangle game. There we go. Triangle game. Yeah. Slanted elevator. It doesn't have to be a four degree of freedom arm. You can do really well with simple sort of concepts. The team that I used to be with 1114 built some of the simplest robots ever and won, got to Einstein, won a world championship with simple but really intense robots. You can go with a simple concept but then go super intense with it. You use the resources to super amplify it and get to the, like the 99th percentile within that range. So like there's reasons to go simple. Ah, this slides, whatever. Um, other strategic design tips. Okay, we're gonna get fun. We're gonna move into the data section, folks. You can't skip this stage. It is so important. But you also, you, you need to know what you want to do before you can figure out how you can do it. Wayne Gretzky always used to say, I don't go to where the puck is. I go to where the puck is going to be. You need to know what you want to do before you can figure out how to do it. But you must be realistic when evaluating strategies. Because if you're trying to figure out how simplicity can work, you have to understand how the game works. 
this is fun. This is new. This is new stuff content, folks, if you haven't seen this one before. There's a rule of thumb. I used to call it the 8421 rule, which was that elite teams can do like eight cycles a match, average four, or like, uh, I'll get into all of it. Right now, I've, I've changed it to 10521 because in the last two years, the top end teams have gotten better at a scary rate. Part of it is the advent of swerve drive. Part of it is the elimination of the bag. The top teams have gotten a lot better. The middle of the pack hasn't gotten much better as of yet, which again makes me concerned about the health of this program. But the top teams keep getting better. So here it is. 10, 5, 2, 1. It used to be 8, 4. I define an elite team as 99th percentile. Can someone in this room tell me approximately how many 99th percentile teams there are in the world this year? Yep. Oh, exactly. There's 3,198 3, teams this year, so 32 teams. So when I say, what's your name? Ryan? I like you, Ryan. There's a difference between being good at math, which I can tell Ryan is, but also being able to contextualize and know the background. So you knew the number, you came right through with the answer. That is beautiful, Ryan. That was so good. So when I'm talking about a 99th percentile team, you might be like, 10 cycles a match, 2056 does 12. Yeah, they're like the 99.9th percentile team. And there's actually a difference in the tail in the graph, a big difference. So 99th percentile, is usually around 10 cycles per match in perfect conditions will probably average about eight cycles per match. I consider a good team the 86th percentile. Does anyone know why I picked 86th percentile? It is one standard deviation above the mean assumed in normal distribution. Uh, the first robotics competition game pieces scored is almost always a normal distribution. It's wild how that bell curve works. Just kind of happens, you know? A 50th percentile team, an average team, usually averaging about two to three cycles per match. Below average team, 25th percentile, usually averaging one. You might be like, are you sure about these numbers? Here's what early season cycles, this is like a week one or two event, has looked like since 2005. Now there are a bunch of caveats on this slides, like I took out some years because they weren't true cycling games. In most games, it's focused only on high goal. This year, I did it on all cycles because I thought all of them were equally important. Last year, I did not focus on the logo because, like, no one did. Notice how these, like, lines don't deviate too much? That's because the rule of thumb has kind of proven itself through history. So let's go look at a late-season event. We now start to see the, uh, the big jump that I talked about that started happening with the higher tier team. So it's kind of peaked upwards. Let's take a look at the championship. You see how horizontal that was? And then last year it just kind of blew up. So it's interesting how these rules of thumbs kind of play, but you look at the averages across time, eight, four, two, one, but then you notice the jump here and that's why it's kind of 10, five, two, one. It's called a rule of thumb for the reason, folks. This is not like an act exact sort of thing. I could have gone through and looked at component OPR data over the last decade and a half and tried to draw something exact, but it's a rule of thumb. It's just to help you estimate things at the beginning of the season. So this is kind of like, you know, how you can figure things out. This is so, so valuable because teams are always like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. To win, an event, to win this event, we gotta be doing 10 cycles a match. No, 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 no. You can win an event doing, you know, being in this average sort of range early in the season. And it changes. There's a reason I have three slides here. Because early in the season, the numbers are lower. And if your goal at the beginning of the season is, we want to qualify for the championship, and you are still in a regional system, rip, um, <laughs> you need to win early. And winning early is the easiest way to qualify for the championship. So if you build a simple robot, that is done early, you will have more practice, you'll be more prepared, and you can stomp through an early event, and you can get yourself to the championship. And if that's your goal, that's a way of doing it. On simple robots, I totally missed something. The other main reason to do a simple robot is that um, a simple robot will fail less because there are less points of failure, there are less things that can break. 
a simple robot will be done earlier, so you have more time to practice, you have more time to program, and when it eventually breaks, you'll have more time to fix it. You don't get those luxuries with a complex robot. Also, there's no bag anymore. So there's a tendency after your first event to be like, okay, we're fixing everything, we're changing everything. The time between events is always shorter than you realize, and the time between events is almost always best used on programming and practice. Give the software guys, you want more time with the robot, right? Yeah. But software folks, actually use the time with the robot, please. I think all the mechanical people know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, folks, it's time for scouting. This is an area that is often neglected by many teams. It offers a great way to get a leg up on the competition. Scouting is one of the best ways to create advantage where none exists. You might feel that, oh, our robot is limited this year, but scouting is the way you can turn it around. It is so valuable for making your pick lists. It is so valuable for predicting your opponent's future strategy. But I want to start with a little bit of a case study here. This is new. I've never done this before. But I have to ask some questions. How many of you have an MBA in this room? OK, for the folks with the MBA, you may have seen this case study before. So if you have, just kind of stay tight on this one. Keep it mum. Um, how many of you have read Range by David Epstein? No one? Really? One person? Okay. You will definitely have seen this before then. So just kind of chill. How many people in this room work for NASA? Okay, we got, we got some. You will definitely have seen this as well. So just, just kind of stay chill for a bit. All right. Carter Racing, folks. They have a massive race in an hour in front of a lot of sponsors on live TV. If their car does well in this race, they will pick up sponsorships to cover the team for years. If they do poorly, or if they have a failure, the sponsors are gonna see and like, we're not funding this team, the team may go defunct, or the failure could lead to something even worse. Who knows, it's, this is a race car, they go fast, you know, there's a thing here. There's a problem though. Of the last 24 races that Carter Racing's had, in the last seven, they've had an engine blowout. If their engine blows out on live TV, it's gonna jeopardize future sponsorships and the future of the team plus safety risks. So seven failures in 24 races. They have a decision to make. They have to decide if they should race or not. The team has a hunch about the failures. They think they might be related to colder weather. So they have an analytics group like any race car team should have, and they put together a graph to test this hunch. Are you serious? Where's my graph? You've got to be, what do you mean this picture can't be displayed? Hold on, can someone get me a hotspot? Okay, I got Wi-Fi here. Give me a second, give me a second, folks. Okay, that's, that's, that's hilarious here. Why can't this picture be displayed? This is breaking everything. Give me a second here. Is it showing Chrome right now? Okay, yeah. Uh, guest mode. Give me a second, folks. Come on, where is this frickin' graph? Oh my goodness, just let it load, hold on. Yeah. I'm not gonna be able to pull up the DM on this laptop though, Tyler, so I just need this page to load. Hurry, come on, speed up, speed up. Let me open another tab. I'm so sorry, folks. I am like mortified at this moment. Thank you, appreciate that, appreciate you. 
Oh, I'm boiling right now. <laughs> oh, come on. Carter, is he in case? I, I, I actually can't. The graph is, like, actually crucial to this. Here we go. I, I'm not ranting about motors. Okay, folks, we got the graph up here. So, here's the seven races with the failures. There is not really a correlation with temperature. So, the question is, should they race or not? Or do you have any questions for the analytics team at Carter Racing? The expected temperature of the race is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that there were two failures at 70 degrees. You were a smart man. So, we're going to hold that because that is the question that was not asked by most business school students. They were given 24 hours with this case. They were asked to ask about other data and most don't ask that question. They are content to look at this. So, as I go back to the slides for a second. Sorry, which question? He asked, could I see some data on the 17 successful races? So, the next slide, okay, as I do this, as I go F5. Folks, folks, just chill. We're going we're gonna to check outside to see what's going on. We're going to check outside to see what's going on. Folks, if we do have to exit the room, I need you to do it as calm and chill. This, we have a lot of people in this room. We have five exits. But Tyler is out there right now just checking to see what's going on, folks, okay? So the alarm did stop. We're going to keep going here. But folks, just be prepared. We got someone looking at it. It is okay, everyone. Stay chill, folks. So the question, okay, it's all clear, everyone. We're all good. Back to Carter Racing. The race, all right, there we go. So the race is in 40 degree Fahrenheit weather. The question is race or withdraw? Do people, let's do a poll. Who thinks that they should race? All right, so we've got some race. Who thinks they should withdraw? Okay, and we got a lot of people who aren't committed yet, which is totally fine. So now let me just go back and pull up the next graph. Yeah, don't paywall me right now, folks. I, I, I'm, I'm not subscribing right now, New Yorker. Here's the graph that you wanted. Folks, does this tell a different story? Here are all the successful races when it's warm. So my question now is, should they race or withdraw? Oh. Folks, you just saved seven astronauts. That might sound weird, right? The Carter race study is based on a real life story of the NASA Space Shuttle Challenger. This was the same sort of discussion, and David, I'm sure you, you know, have learned about this many times over, David, uh, Voracek from NASA, they had the same dilemma on O-ring failures on the space shuttle. Exact same data, that's where this is taken from. And no, no one thought in the moments before the, to ask the question about what about the successful launches. You all just saved seven astronauts. I'm very impressed with this room that you nailed this. Because most business students get this wrong. And it's okay that they get it wrong. The case study is designed to be a hard one. It is okay to get things wrong, folks. It, what you need to do is learn from those mistakes. Um, I didn't catch your name right there. Michael? Great question. Why did I just do this exercise, folks? No, like seriously, why did I do the exercise? Someone tell me. Right there. Not just the importance of data, the importance and the limitations of data and why you should question the data. So this comes up in FRC 
all the time. This is more. There will be a team who doesn't move in two matches, but does great in the rest of their matches. And some teams will look at them and just be like, they failed twice, we can't pick them at all. While other teams will be like, they were awesome in their eight matches, we have to pick, put them at the top of our pick list. I would argue that both are wrong. I would argue that, yes, you need to look at all the data, but then you need to ask questions about it. Why did they have zero game pieces scored in those two matches? Was it because they tipped over twice? Because that might be systematic. Was it because they had a Falcon motor fail? Might be systematic. Might be something that could be repaired with some Loctite. Maybe the team had fixed it. Maybe there's a trend. Did they fail early? Did they fail late? These are the questions you have to ask. But for us to be good scouts, you have to dive deep into the data. You can't just look at it. And one trap that everyone falls into is like, yeah, let's get an Excel spreadsheet. We have all the game pieces per match. Sort, and there's our list. That's pretty good still. Better than the teams who are just picking on ranking. But there is a lot better that can be done. So you need to do this. I love the person who's like, when I was like, why did I do this? To make us cry. I would never intentionally make people cry. <laughs> okay, advanced scouting. Uh, I'm going to blaze through some of this because I want to get to the more advanced topics. But it is looking back at past events. And so there's lots of things you can look at. How many of you are familiar with the stat OPR? Okay, good, good, good. Do you know who invented that stat? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that's been lost through history. And I'm just like, it wasn't just me, my college roommate and I uh, came up with one night when we were bored. Um, Ian McKenzie was his name. He's uh, now finishing his PhD in something and designed his own CAD software in his spare time. He's like super, super, super genius, like one of the smartest people. I, very lucky to live with them. Dude, that's hilarious because <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Ian, you're, you're my friend now. So how does OPR work? So when we're looking at ways to rank teams, one concept would be to look at their average score, which is actually a pretty good metric that a lot of teams don't use. But like we know there's three teams on a field, so we want to split this out. Also, like the best way to do it was be to have scouted data to know exactly what happened. You can't watch every match from this season. Like, I, you know, would love to watch every one of Wild Stang's matches. Actually, I think I might have. But um, you can't know about every team. So there needs to be a way to contextualize things. And that's what advanced stats do. And so with OPR, it's looking at every team's contribution to a match. This is some linear algebra. It is second year linear algebra. Most high school students can understand it. I'm sure my friend Ryan over here has like got it or whatever, everything like that. But there's basically, for every alliance, there is an equation where you take the three teams, you represent them by a variable, ti plus tj plus tk, where s is the amount of points scored by the alliance. Every single match produces two rows in your matrix. And then you do that for every single match. And then, the matrix actually can be invertible if you do a couple tricks or you row reduce and use some least squares approximation. And now you've calculated the average contribution of each team throughout the regional or event. Sorry, just, you can tell how old these slides are. But that's how OPR works. It's basically using linear algebra to solve the system of equations to figure out on average what, how many points a team is contributing. This stuff is really good. So how good was it in 2023? Pretty good. The game is fairly separable, meaning tasks aren't super tied together where it's hard to strip them apart with linear algebra. Um, 2019, this is my favorite study of why OPR works, and it just was hilarious. There was this team in 2019, Team 6378, and uh, they were nicknamed the Plunger Bot. Um, I might have given them that nickname, but the robot, they literally had a plunger on their robot, and they only scored panels. They only scored panels, and they scored panels so quickly. I was looking at their component OPR data, and component OPR data is 
OPR data, but to a specific type of scoring, where you solve the matrix against just cargo points or whatever. And I was showing this to a friend of mine, and she's like, well, the stupid stat you invented doesn't even work. I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't work? She's like, well, their component OPR for cargo is a positive number, but they didn't, this team doesn't even pick up a piece of cargo. They're the stupid suction robot that you always talk about. I'm like, hey, don't, don't, don't hurt my suction cup robot. They, sorry, I called it the plunger bot because they had a plunger on their robot. It's making more sense. Why did the plunger bot have a positive cargo OPR if they couldn't score cargo? Pardon? Exactly. They were so good at scoring panels, and in that game, you could only score cargo if there was a panel up already. So even though they didn't score any cargo, the stat realized from all their matches, more cargo was scored because of their presence. And that is wild. That is an advanced stat picking up more than a conventional stat. Because if you looked at a conventional stat, they'd be like, oh, no cargo scored. They don't score the cargo. That's why these stats matter. It's wild that a stat that we came up with in my basement in 2004, 15 years later, was spitting out knowledge like this. Super, super cool. Also why OPR is good this year, uh, the, uh, what, what am I even saying? Component OPRs is, are great because you can get down to the real details. This year, my favorite piece of data is the component OPR for game pieces scored. I've run some correlations with scouted data and it is like nearly bang on. It is so accurate, which is wild to think about. You always have a favorite metric in the game. I do not like the total points metric in a game this year for the amount of points an alliance a team has contributed. Can anyone tell me why I don't like that? Ian, we've talked so much today, so I'm gonna go to, right, right here, Zoe. Links do screw things up. That's one that's hard, but there's another big reason. The charging station. Because there will be, only one team can balance the charging station in autonomous. And so only one team gets credit for that. And that throws off the whole total points metric. I just love with going total game pieces because especially now where grids are getting fuller, like yes, you score more points for going high, but sometimes a team will do fewer on the high because they have better partners. So total game pieces, it's a, a great metric. Keep track of it. Like, if, honestly, like if you see me or whatever and you're like, hey, we had a great match, tell me two numbers. Tell me how many you scored in auto, how many you scored in teleop. That gives me an idea, a snapshot of how good that match is. The magic number this weekend, 310, 310. If you were doing three in autonomous, you were doing 10 in teleop, you're one of the best teams in the world and you have a chance to win the championship as a captain or the first pick. Those are big numbers. If you were doing... One plus seven, you are in the range to be a second pick here at the championship. If you think, wait, I can do a way more than that, probably not going to be a second pick. Um, however, there are like a billion teams at this event who can do seven game pieces in a match. It is going to be up to all of you to figure out how to sort them. Good luck. Uh, my friend Ian asked me about OPR versus EPA. EPA is a new stat. It is based on the ELO ranking system, which popularized itself in the world of competitive chess. I'm serious. Uh, it's also popular in college football rankings. The BCS used to use it. Um, I don't, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation for me to break down EPA, but there's a good explanation on the Statbotics website, statbotics.io. Both are super useful. I think OPR is a better indication of what a team has done at a given event while EPA is a better predictor of future events because EPA factors in more than just the given event, it factors in how the team did at prior events and even in prior seasons. I think all of us would be foolish to say that our past knowledge of teams doesn't tell us something. Like it would be very silly of me to say, like here, I'll tell you this one folks, next year, 254 and 2056 are going to be good. But OPR, OPR doesn't know that. OPR doesn't look at anything in the past. EPA does, and EPA is a better predictor in that way. However, if you are looking at the component OPR on the Blue Alliance this week, don't start looking at OPR until every team has played five or six matches. OPR is very volatile early on 
because it is an under-constrained system of linear algebra that you're trying to solve. And an under-constrained system means your solutions can be all over the place. It takes about six matches to stabilize. Once you get to six matches, it's hard for teams to really move their OPR too much. Um, the great thing is, you're probably getting five or six matches tomorrow. That's just a guess. Campbell? So in the 2014 game, I bet you if we go back on the Statbotics website, they, they've backdated their stats. I bet you EPA would be the go-to for, for that one. The 2007 FRC game was the worst one for OPR, and it was like heartbreaking for me because like we'd only developed it a couple years ago, and then people were like, oh, your new stat's stupid. I'm like, oh, I don't think it's stupid, but that game was had exponential scoring, if you could believe that. If you got like two game pieces in a row, it was two points, three was four, uh, sorry, it was two to the X. So if you scored two game pieces, it's two points. If you scored eight game pieces not in a row, it would be worth 16 points. But if you score them in a row, it was worth 256 points. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You wonder why some of your mentors are like a little strange? The game when I was in high school, listen to this. You got points for putting balls on rails, one, two, or three, based on height. Then there was a multiplier based on the amount of balls you put in the center goal except the multiplier was two to the power of the amount of balls you put in the center goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And guess what, folks? There was no real-time scoring back then. <laughs> Literally, the reason I probably got chosen as a drive coach for my team that year was I was the only one who could calculate the score. <laughs> but it'd be like, oh, yeah, we scored seven in there, and we had seven points on there, 128 times seven. You know, like, it's like, it's like what are we even doing? Scores were weird that year. My point is, Campbell, um, I would always look to see another stat, maybe in a game that's less separable, look to see if there's a component factor that could have been involved there. Back then, the first um, API didn't report component sort of dat data or whatever, but like the number of trusses achieved would have been one of that sort of thing, but EPA would have been super valuable in a game like that. No problem. These are the questions I come for. They're good. Okay. Um, why did I leave the pit scouting slide in? Oh, I left the pit scouting slide in. Stop being jerks to people who are pit scouting, folks. All right? So, like, I get it. Someone's going to come to your pit. They're probably going to be annoying. They're going to be like, how many wheels does your robot have? There is no reason to send them on a wild goose chase to be sarcastic with them. Lots of people don't get sarcasm. And when they don't get sarcasm, it's not actually fun for them. So, like, let's not have fun at other people's expense. If you're going to have fun at someone else's expense, make sure they are in on the joke. It's why you make fun of your friends and not, like, random people. Or like, why you make fun of someone to their face and not behind their back. So, like, let's be a little bit kind. I always tell this story. There was a team who, um, in alliance selection, like, I was saying, in general, be kind to people. They didn't want to be picked by a certain team. So when the team came to talk to them, their lead scout pretended to be deaf. <laughs> so the team, what did they do? They went and they found a sign language interpreter. <laughs> Don't be jerks, folks. True story, folks. I will not tell you who it was. Okay, match scouting. We've danced around this. What are you keeping track of in match scouting? You want to keep track of not necessarily everything, because you don't want to overwhelm your scouts, but um, points scored by teams, attempts and failures, penalties, other things. Here's one I think you should all be keeping track of this weekend. I'm giving it away. This one's free. I think teams should be keeping track of the amount of times teams cross, via, cross into the community or out of the community via the charge station. Why do I think that's important? So, I, I heard someone say pinch point, right? Yes. And in general, I think that when you get to the playoffs and you have an alliance where you're trying to fill the entire grid, if you were constantly relying on people going through the non-bump side or the two openings, three robots through two openings is a bottleneck and it's going to slow you down. I recommend that everyone looks at the match from the Texas State Championship where 148, 118, and 3005 played together. Now, obviously, just watch it because they are awesome teams but they played the lane strategy perfectly. And 148 stayed in the middle lane and just crossed over the charge station over and over again. 
A team that can cross the charge station over and over again is the dream second pick. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, does everyone here like scouting? The people who are here? Do you have teammates who hate scouting? Yeah. So number one, we talked about passions. You want scouts who like what they're doing. So obviously the people who like scouting, hey, you got a question right there? What's up? Yeah. I um, I look. I I definitely am a proponent of pit scouting, but I look for different things. First of all, I typically don't ask students to ask other teams questions. I say just go and observe and look at things. Um, I'm less looking at. So number one, it's just nice to know if they have a swerve drive or not. That's an important thing. Um, I like to know the robot's weight. For can I? Can we push them? Can they be pushed? Um, Dimensions this year, super valuable for knowing how many can fit on the charge station really easily. Things like that are really good pit scouting. The best place to go for pit scouting is the inspection station and their whiteboard. Take a picture of that, that gets you all the data you want. I like some other esoteric things. I'm a big believer in that finding correlation points. So there is not an easy way to scout um, a team's attention to detail and their drive to win. But I do that by looking at bumper quality. If I'm looking for a second pick, bumper quality matters. Not because I care about their bumpers, but if they can put a lot of attention and detail to their bumpers, that means they've put attention and detail on other things of their robot. A, not a pit scouting one, but something that you match scouting. I like to watch to see the teams that at the end of autonomous get to their controllers the fastest. Can someone ask, tell me why I like that one? Right here? Exactly. If you notice, the top teams get to their controllers the fastest because they really, really care. Every single thing, detail matters. When I see a team that's super aloof about going to their controllers, it's like, I don't know if that's a team I want on the Elim on Elimination Alliance, completely honest. I want a team that is going to be hardcore. Um, watch how they work in the pit watch their teamwork, those sorts of things. These are not the normal things that most pit scouts look for, but these are correlation factors, which may have correlations to success in a lot of different ways. Question over there. Yep, a absolutely. Um, another thing, not just electrical, but just like, I look for like reliability in electrical systems and whatever. It's like, hey, if this robot fails, can they be repaired in an eight-minute break during the double elimination tournament? Yes, my friend. I, I honestly think you should leave that up to mouth scouting because I think you're not... You, it's not that people lie. It's that people are optimistic about what they can do. And so... I don't think the teams are going out to deceive, but it's like, oh, yeah, 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 we can score high. We did it once at our practice field on a goal that wasn't actually full height. But, you know, so I'd rather, you can ask, but like for stuff like that, I want to trust what I see on the field. I think the best, it's too late for this now, but coming to the championship, especially now with pretty much every single match video available in the Blue Alliance, I think what you should do is for every team in your division, find six matches at their most recent event and scout them and pull in that data so you're not writing blank on data going into day one. You have something accurate. When you do that, use a random sampling of six matches or like I typically like to do like five qualification, one playoff match. 
strategies do change a little bit in playoffs. Qualifications gets you a better indication of what they're going to do in qualifications. This is so important because this scouting is for your first few qualification matches. So looking at playoffs isn't necessarily the thing right there. Um, but be careful, because we're going to get to it, about small sample sizes. All right. Averages versus maximums. The term average and the term maximum are very much confused by FRC teams. Averages include matches where you don't move because your radio lost power. Fact. Some teams just kind of ignore those in averages. Averages include the matches where you got defended for a minute and 30 seconds. Some teams like to ignore those. Teams usually say average when they mean maximum over perfect conditions. This goes back to my, questions, my friend's question about pit scouting. So you could ask a team like, how many game pieces can you score in a match? Team might say, yeah, 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 10. But you might say, how many do you average? Oh, yeah, yeah, 10. No, 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 they're remembering the one time they scored 10 on their practice field. And so these terms are very, very important. Beware of strategists who use these terms interchangeably. Uh, the match strategy negotiation, I didn't make any slides about this, maybe we should talk about it, um, is super, super important. And your alliance is going to do the best if you are honest about your data. If you overrepresent what you can do, your alliance is going to plan a strategy that is not the right strategy. So if you come into these meetings for some reason of bravado trying to talk about how much you can do, you're actually hurting your alliance and yourself. So it's important to be accurate about this. That's why it's always important to have your own data. I remember in 2017, I was helping 1114, and there was this team that comes to us like, yeah, 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 we score uh, seven gears per match. I'm like, you score seven gears per match. So I'm like, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, so you're the best team in the division. 6'10 is scoring six and a half. You're better than them. It's like, we're not better than 6'10. Like, Your numbers say you are. Like, sometimes teams just kind of like don't understand maximum versus average. That's why you need your own data. I like, when I'm running strategy for a team, I like it when the scouts give me four data pieces. I would like to know the team's minimum, their minimum greater than zero, which helps me filter out their lowest when the robot at least worked, their average, and their max. That being said, with so few data points, why not look at everything? It is nice when your scouts present you with like a little cheat or like an app or something that's just, you see the numbers of like, okay, they did seven, five, eight, eight, six, four. And then you can see trends as well. So don't rely solely on averages. The small sample size theater is like, it's dangerous. Um, so, at the end of the first day of the competition, you have two teams. that One has 5.7 cycles per match and 5.2 cycles per match. What's the actual difference between those teams? First day of competition here, so you have like six matches. Three game pieces, folks. Three game pieces. It's really not that big of a difference. But it seems like a big difference. So beware of ordinal ranks. When you rank teams based on average, you might just be like, oh, well, this team is like 10th and this team's 15th. That's a huge difference. But it might be 5.7 to 5.2. I really believe when you're ranking teams, you need to keep them in tiers. And within the tier, use a tiebreaker. Don't come to the tiebreaker only if it's like 5.4 and 5.4. Like these ranges actually matter. So in your divisions at championship, you'll probably have like two tier one teams. Or if you're an Archimedes, like seven. <laughs> Sorry, folks, have fun. Um, and then you'll probably have like six tier two teams. And then you'll probably have like 12 tier three. And then you'll have like 20, usually doubles. It's like, you know, bell curve, folks, bell curve, bell curve. Uh, but having teams in tiers as opposed to just trusting your ordinal rank. How are we doing on time, folks? Ooh, OK. All right, this is the last presentation, so I feel like I can go a little bit late, but I know you all want to get home, or... No. <laughs> okay. okay, alliance selection. How do you decide on who to pick? Well, you rank teams based on all the data. I want to talk about the do not pick list. How many teams here have a do not pick list usually? Okay, okay. Not okay. Should you have one or is it excessive? I don't think it's excessive to have a do not pick list. 
But you better have a good reason for putting the team on a do not pick list. Reasons to put a team on a do not pick list, 99% of them should be their robot is incompatible with our robot. It just occupies the same space. It just, the alliance wouldn't work. There are the other 1% where uh, you could have had a bad ma match and the drive coaches ended up yelling at each other, things like that. But like, be careful about putting a team on a do not pick list because of the behavior or actions of one person on a team or what could be a misunderstanding. I think it's important to not go into these sorts of things assuming ill intent. Assume the best of the other side. On the other hand, if someone on another team has been abusive or bullying or racist or homophobic or something like that, that may just be, hey, our team values, we just do not want to play with a team like that. However, I think it's important to have your lead mentor talk to the lead mentor on their team because if someone doesn't know about the mistakes they've made, there's no opportunity to correct that behavior. And some people won't correct their behavior. Some people are just jerks. Um, but other times there's a learning opportunity here. So be careful about doing these sorts of things in a vacuum and um, be careful about stigmatizing teams based on things that have happened in the past because everyone grows and everyone gets better in sorts of ways. I'm not trying to say that there are teams that you just can't work with. There definitely are. But uh, do not pick lists can be a little bit harsh. Maybe you move them down a little bit on the list. I don't know. It's hard to weigh different criteria. Um, how many of you are familiar with the scorched earth strategy? The scorched earth strategy of alliance selection is if you were the number one seed and you might actually be like the seventh best team at the event and you know some teams are going to decline you, what should you do? Should you pick them or should you not pick them? Thank you, everyone. You should pick them. There will be some folks at this event who will come to you as the number one seed and be like, hey, you know, I know you're going to pick us, but we really want to form our own alliance. So it would be more gracious to be professional if you didn't pick us. <laughs> they are playing a game. They are playing a game, and they are trying to mess with you because they don't want to be picked by you, but they do want to be picked by number two. Don't fall into the trap. Also, folks, if someone from outside your division that you don't know comes to you to offer you suggestions about alliance selection, that is a red flag, folks. That is a red flag. People at this competition are not just trying to win their division. There are some people who are trying to win the whole tournament, which is great. More power to you. But they will play some games, including trying to break up top alliances on divisions they're not in. You may have a team that even comes to you and says, hey, I've got some great advice on how to play defense against a certain team. That's weird. That's weird. And maybe it's beneficial. Maybe it's, it's like, maybe you actually want to play defense on this team or whatever, but I just said don't assume ill intent. And I don't want you to assume ill intent. But there's weird things that happen at the championship, folks. Uh, there are some teams that are playing like 9D chess out there. And I just want you all to be aware that you are on the playing field, all of us. So it's, it's just a little bit odd. But um, I do think it's important to, if you're the number one seed, pick whoever you want to pick. There is not an ungraciously professional pick. If they decline, that is their choice. That is totally cool. But you earn the number one seed, and you earn the right to control how things go. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, and it makes for a really fun tournament when the earth does get scorched because it kind of breaks things up a little bit. If someone comes to you and says, hey, you don't want to break up this alliance because that means that Archimedes, or like, let me use a division that's not here. What divisions did they get rid of? Carver. Carver. Oh, yeah, that's a good one to get rid of. Uh, <laughs> bad, bad experiences on Carver. Um, it was really sad. Um, yeah, but like someone, it's like if... If these two teams don't get together, Carver can't win the championship. Does it hurt your chances of winning the championship? That was what you need to be focused on. Hand up right over there. Absolutely. There are so many reasons to make a pick list. Number one, it's a great process. You learn a lot through that. It's the same reason why I think that all teams should submit for the impact award, even if you don't think you have a chance of winning that award. I think you learn a lot through the process. 
I think even if you aren't a captain, it's important to have a pick list because you may be picked and then you, there's the next pick. And oh, is the second pick at the championship going to matter so much this year? And you want to have your influence on what you want. All of you tonight, tonight, should go to your hotels or wherever you're staying and come up with a list of criteria of what is the perfect alliance partners for us. What do we want in alliance partners? So then when you have the data, you'll know what to look for. Because guess what? You're going to have like 20 teams all in the same tier who all score about seven game pieces per match. And you have to find a way to sort them. And your way of sorting should be teams that play strategically the way you want them to play. So maybe it's crossing up the charge station. Maybe you really want a bump team or whatever. Question? I don't think consistency is a deal breaker. I think it is absolutely something you look at. Um, I think if I am the number one alliance captain, I am absolutely, especially for my second and sorry, my second and third robots here, I am looking for consistency because I'm the number one alliance captain. I'm going to pick the best team in the division. I want consistency. If I am on alliance eight, I want to get things spicy. I want a little bit of volatility. So that team that was like 2, like two, ten, two, ten, two, ten. yeah, they have some twos, but I'm probably going to lose anyways. Give me that shot at those tens, and then, hey, who knows what's going to happen. Billy? I think at the end of the day, if your goal, it depends on your goal. If your goal is just to progress further than your team's ever progressed, go for consistency. If your goal is to win the championship, take that big shot. Also, folks, it may be if you're the number one seed in a division. Well, I mean, why am I using hypotheticals? Everyone's terrified of what's going to come out of Archimedes, whether it be 254 and 2056 or 118 and 111 or some combination of this. It is going to be super, super high powered. If you're in another division and you're the number one seed, you may be thinking, is my goal to win this division or is my goal to win the championship? And I don't know what the answer is. Some teams are be thrilled just to win a division, while other teams have won many divisions and are here to win a championship. The team who is, here, is like, our goal, we got to win the championship, may take a higher volatility team because they want the upside to try and beat 254 and 111, or they want the upside to beat 1678 and 3005. Another team who just wants to win the division is like, give me the consistency. And so that is a, that is a tough one. But strategy should be based, different based on your selection point and based on your goals. This comes back to goal setting at the beginning of the season. Um, how many of you are familiar with the efficient market hypothesis? Okay, good. Got some investors in here. The efficient market hypothesis is what, an efficient market is one where everyone has access to all information such that it's impossible to beat the market assuming everyone is acting rationally. I think about this a lot. Is an FRC event an efficient market? No. Interesting. Can someone explain why you said no? That's a good answer. So I will, I will debate you a bit. I agree with everything you just said there. I think the answer is sometimes. Because sometimes you get to an event where you have eight captains who are looking at all the data and are acting rationally. So I think the answer is sometimes. Most of the time, no. Uh, I am from Ontario. It is a pretty efficient market up there. The teams, uh, how many Ontario teams do we got in here? I see Beals here. I got, where are all my Canadians at? What, they like, see me all every day and they're like, they don't want to be here? What, what, what is that? Um, the, the, pardon? There we go, there we go. The part, oh my goodness, stop, stop. Um, the level of scouting and strategy in Ontario is so high that like sometimes I will make my own pick list before a line selection because I don't know, what else are you going to do when you're emceeing an event? And it's just like bang, 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 bang is like perfect. 
And then there are other events where it's just like, what just happened? <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that without getting in trouble. We got picked by a Georgia team once. I'm not telling this story. <laughs> but so success in alliance selection comes from exploiting efficient inefficiencies and irrationality. So when a, a major inefficiency is there are some teams that don't look at all the data and they just pick based off the standings. And if you were on a cap if you were a captain of another team that you see a team looking up at the standings to make their pick, just celebrate right there because the team that you want just bubbled up. That is amazing. On the other hand, you should be very prepared when there is a very smart team behind you in alliance selection order. So if you're the number one seed and you're like, oh, I got an eye on this sleeper. Gonna get him at robot number 24, we're gonna get him. And then you see like 4039 makeshift as the number four captain, just give up. Makeshift's gonna get the team. They're smart, they know it. There are some teams that just like move on to the next option. So you wanna exploit that. I'd, Another inefficiency, actually this is more an irrationality that is an inefficiency, is there are some teams who are addicted to picking their friends. And that can be exploited because sometimes the best team is the one you don't actually know. And I get the comfort factor of picking a team that you've worked with before, you understand how they work with. Alliances are like human relations, like it matters. But sometimes teams make mistakes and there's other teams left to you. So you gotta be exploiting these sorts of inefficiencies. Yes, question, Red. Uh, you said that tiebreaker like 1,000%, 1,000%. I just think that sometimes teams weigh that tiebreaker a little bit too early. On the other hand, I'm from a team where we have won 19 of 20 events with the same team before. So <laughs> what do I know on that one? It's like we just kept ended up picking them or they picked us, it just kind of happened. Um, a question I get a lot is how do you pick for defense? I know it's not super applicable this week, but this is being recorded, it's gonna be watched by people in the future, so I wanna talk about it. To find a good defense robot is, number one, look for teams who have made the top team struggle. So if you were looking at the number one team at the event, who you were probably trying to beat, and you see their numbers are 10, 10, 10, 6, 10, 10. Look at that six match, see what happened in there. But not necessarily just pick, it's like, oh, well that team's the team to pick. Look at that team and look for other teams who have commonalities to that team. Because you're not necessarily gonna see every, ro ro like, if this was a game where you wanted a defense robot, you might not, pick a team who'd actually demonstrated defense at the event because everyone's gonna be focusing on scoring during quals. So you have to look at the characteristics. One weird thing that happened last year at the championship, when teams were picking defense robots, every single defense robot that was picked had a common factor. Does anyone know what it was? Swerve drive. It is wild that we've come to this point where before tank drive was the drive train to pick because it's like, hey, all else fails, this tank drive can play defense or whatever. Unlike a mechanical drive which struggles with that sort of thing. Swerve drive was like considered as the fancy offense robot. But swerve defense, especially against tank drives, is murderous. And last year champs watching some swerve bots just utterly shut down tank drive bots was like, oh, the paradigm has shifted. At uh, the 2019 Ontario Provincial Championship, Team 4907 was picked as a defense robot by 2056 and 3683, and they were a swerve drive. And they played D on 1114 and 1241, and it was like, what is happening? Just like, just circling the rocket, just like, whoo, 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 it is wild. So there were, in a future game, you may see that a top team has been shut down by a swerve drive team. It's not necessarily saying pick that swerve drive team, but pick other swerve drive teams who play that sort of same style. You cannot just rely on teams having demonstrated defense because some of the best defense robots never play defense in quals because they're too busy scoring points. And you have to be able to see that. And that's a thing that a lot of teams miss. 
Um, okay, this might be the last slide I get to. What time is it? Folks, how are you gonna get picked at this event? I get asked this question a lot, so I figured I'd put it into the presentation. Number one, you gotta figure out what your goals are. Is your goal to be Alliance Captain one to three, or is your goal to be picked by four to eight, or is your goal to be a first round pick, a second round pick, a third round pick? You need to be realistic with what you're looking for. But always, the number one way to get picked is to demonstrate what is in demand. This year, this is now Karthik's opinion. This is not like a strategic rule of thumb or whatever. It's what I think of this game. I could be wrong. I've been on many teams. We have only won the championship once. So I've been wrong a lot of times. Some people say 11-14 has choked on Einstein multiple times. I say that's mean, but uh, <laughs> we obviously, there was years where we had the best robot in the world and we didn't win the championship. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about here. But I think I do. I think the number one thing, if you want to be a second or third round pick here at the championship, It's someone's phone? <laughs> I'm gonna change my ringtone to be eh! <laughs> Okay, everyone, number one thing you can do, sorry, I got something in my eye here. I'm gonna work on this while I talk. You need to have a preload scoring autonomous mode that also gets the mobility points and balances the charge station. You may be a team who's been running your two-piece auto mode all season long, but if you think you're going to be a second pick at the championship, they're not going to pick you for running that two-piece auto because it's going to be a three-piece on the left and a three-piece on the right, and they need someone down the center. You should get to the practice field tomorrow morning and start working on this mode. It is non-trivial. You may think it's like, oh, yeah, we can just do it. Auto modes just don't happen overnight unless you're like a really weird programmer and they're such a challenge to deal with. <laughs> Avoid penalties at all costs, folk. Penalties, all these matches in the playoffs on Saturday are going to be extremely close. Penalties can do you in. Do not be the team who's known for getting penalties. Please stay upright. <laughs> Please stay upright. There are gonna be some teams who go over constantly. That's something you wanna avoid. I also know the jokes, folk. I know the jokes because I make them sometimes. Hey, let's pick a really tippy robot as our third robot at championship and just put them in the way of 2056 and see what happens. <laughs> that is a strategy, folks. I have no other comments. <laughs> Total cycles matter. Total cycles matter. Location matters less. Why? Because of the team update. Team update 21, a low cycler's value has increased. You may have been a high goal cycler all season long, but maybe you were like iffy at the high. Maybe you want to focus on being a low ro robot right now. I did a lot of pre-scouting, and there was a lot of teams who started pivoting in week five and week six. It's not too late, folks. It doesn't mean you have to abandon high, but maybe you start low and you show off how many you can do low. Um, I think the ability to score cones low is a very underrated factor after this update because cones don't bounce as much as cubes do. And if there's already a cube and you're trying to supercharge a node, dropping a cube on top of a cube is like dropping a beach ball on top of a beach ball. The cone just kind of goes. Um, as always, top teams should be picking for consistently lower seeds need to go for the high. Folks, I'm sorry, I'm going to... I, just skipping through a bunch of slides because we're here at the end. I will stick around if anyone wants questions or selfies or whatever else. You want to talk NBA draft, you want to talk swimming, that's great. I actually can't swim, but I'm like the biggest swimming fan in the world. It's really weird. I'm, I don't understand. It's, I don't know. Final comments. Number one, always read the rules. Number two, come up with a clear, consistent strategy for how your robot will play the game. Always remember the golden rules. Scouting is the easiest way to make your team more successful at competition. I didn't cover coaching, but um, if you want to contact me, uh, you can DM me on Twitter or Instagram. Um, I want you to read Range by David Epstein. It is a great book. It is absolutely worth your time. It is fabulous. 
Um, I want to finish the presentation on uh, a couple notes. Number one, I want to say thank you for being here. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with me right now. I appreciate that. Uh, number two, you are all passionate people. I want you to take the lessons that you've learned in this presentation, take them forward to your teams, take them forward to your community. Not just the lessons about how to improve your robot, but the various comments I made about gracious professionalism and how to behave. I think it matters so much. I would love it if all the best teams in first were known for being the best teams off the field. And I think 99.9% .9 of them are, but sometimes teams drift. And I want you to be the, the keepers of the culture, making sure that your teams don't drift while trying to strive for excellence and strive for perfection all the way. Um, I had a great economics professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, his name was Larry Smith. And at the end of uh, the semester, he would always say, um, I would wish you luck on your final exam, except luck is not a real thing. Instead, I'm going to wish you success. And to all of you, I wish you success this weekend. I wish you success in life, and I wish you success in everything you do. Thank you for being here, folks. <laughs> folks, I'm going to stick around to take questions up at the front or anything, so uh, come on over. I'm